Hello, my name is Dr. Joseph Crumbly. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I'll be your narrator through this training on hope, fantasy, and denial. This module is one of five modules that have been developed for a training course entitled Engaging Relative Caregivers, Managing Risk Factors in Kinship Care. You're now about to see a video clip of me doing training with professionals on kinship care, and I'll be addressing several questions. The first question is, what are the cues and sources of hope, fantasy, and denial experienced by relative caregivers? The qu second question is, what are the goals, approaches, and scripts you might be able to use with relative caregivers in helping them manage their hopes and their fantasies and denial? And the third question that we'll be looking at was what are the differences in hope, fantasy, and denial between relative caregivers compared to non-relative foster parents and adopted parents? I'd like to ask the viewing audience to address two additional questions. The first question is how does hope, fantasy, and denial impact a caregiver's ability to provide safety, protection, and well-being? How can hope be a risk factor to safety and protection? And the second question is, what goals and approaches and scripts would be useful in your practice in working with relative caregivers? So please sit back, relax, and I'll rejoin you at the end of this video clip to summarize the training. Thank you. Hope, fantasy, and denial. Uh, let me start off with the exercise. And here's my question to you. What does hope do for you and give you? What does hope allow you and give you? Expectations. Expectations. Encouragement. Encouragement. Resilience. Resilience. Inspiration. Inspiration. Motivation. Motivation. Nice. Okay. Now, this may sound strange, but if you substitute the word denial for hope, you may have similar outcomes. Denial can give you inspiration because you don't give up. Denial can give you determination because you don't give up. What was the other things you said? Resilience. resilience. Denial can give you resilience because you're still determined. What was the other things you said? Encouragement. encouragement. Right. Denial can give you encouragement. All right. The reason why I did that is because what we may call denial, relative caregivers may call what? Hope. Okay? You know, the reason why I'm sharing you, the sharing, I sound like I know so much, but the reason why I know that is because I used to be working with relative caregivers saying, that's denial, 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 spending all that energy, and they would be coming back to me saying, no, that's hope. I'm telling my d children, I was working with a relative caregiver whose daughter was on death row, and she was allowing the child to believe mom was coming home. And I'm saying, that's denial. You can't de keep doing that. No, that's called hope. Because even if she's on a gurney, the phone's going to ring. That's hope. Can you, can you hear the relative caregiver? And, I, and it made me kind of like re-look at that, re-look at denial and hope and how it can look different for them. Hope does become a risk factor when that relative caregiver is not able to provide alternative planning or implement safety plans or develop permanency plans. Then it becomes a risk factor. And that's why we have to address it because it can become a risk factor. So what are some of those sources? for hopes and denials. Hoping that the children are gonna go back home. <laughs> Expecting the birth parent to accomplish requirements for reunification. He's gonna do it this time. She's gonna do it this time. So that becomes the hope. Caregivers hope for resuming their previous lifestyle and their goals. Going back on retirement. I'm gonna have this house to myself again. I'm gonna be able to have my bathroom to myself again. I'm gonna be able to go to church. I'm gonna be able to travel. So those become the hopes. Perception of the birth parent's character and personality. My child is gonna do what she says she's gonna do this time. He's really gonna follow through. He's a good person. I raised him to be a good person. It's their belief in what they put in that birth parent that can also tie into that as a brother or as a sister or as a relative caregiver. And then it's the child's hope 
that makes relative caregivers hope. If I stop hoping, then the child's gonna stop hoping. I have to believe in their parents so they believe in their parents. You know, they've had so many disappointments, so hope that the children have, so how do you hear it? What are your cues? He's summing the statements. I know my son will get it together this time. Even if it's the fifth rehab, I know they're gonna do it. That's hope. See how that could sound like denial? It's the fifth rehab, what you talking about? No, it's called hope, <laughs> okay, for that relative caregiver. <laughs> he couldn't have done that. I didn't raise him that way, and he told me that he didn't do it. You see what's happening there? You know, it's my belief in how I raised that child. It's my belief in how we were raised as brothers and sisters, because aunts and uncles can talk like that as well. I'm looking forward to going back. I'm looking forward to kids going back. I'm looking forward to being a grandparent again. I'll be glad when I can be on my own again. I don't plan to be taking care of kids for the rest of my life. So that's how you hear it. You and your ages, now these next two I think are important because this is when I find relative caregivers don't want to, they're in denial now. They don't want to admit that the birth parent is doing something wrong. So they're looking for excuses, they're grabbing for hopes, and they start th saying things like, is you and your agencies, your, you and your agency want my child to fail? It's your attitudes that make her give up her hope. This next one, you don't want her to get the kids back. That's why she's not cooperating. So again, it's your not believing and hoping in their birth child, in their birth parent, in the birth parent that's making them give up hope and not cooperating. You might even hear things like, I don't want to crush the child's hope of returning home, especially after hearing, after their parents have made so many promises and broke them. That's the other part. I don't want my son to think that I've given up on him or that I believe the things they're saying about him. So forget about me adopting. To stop hoping is to give up on the birth parent. To stop hoping is to, be, is to abandon the birth parent. To stop hoping is to appear as though you're being disloyal to the birth parent. So that can keep them holding on and go into denial. So what are your goals? Now let me just back up. If you don't hear them say these things, still do your assessments. Make sure you use assessments to determine if they're having those kinds of feelings. You know, so you're gonna to need to ask questions like, well, what are your hopes for the birth parent? What are your hopes for your child? What are your hopes for yourself? You know, what do you plan to do with your time? Okay, what are you gonna do if they don't? What's your backup plan? So that way you can assess whether or not they're planning and if they're preparing for it. So use your assessments to help you come up with those kinds of questions and to look at how you're gonna do your interventions. So here are your goals. Starts off with, and this may sound strange, your first goal is to make sure that the relative caregivers can implement safety, protection, and service plans that you help them develop, even if the caregiver feels that they're not necessary. Now I know that may sound strange, but the caregivers may not, this is how it works. If the caregiver doesn't believe that that birth parent abused the child. If the caregiver doesn't believe that that birth parent is guilty of abuse and neglect, if the caregiver doesn't believe that there's any problems or risk factors, then they're not gonna feel it's necessary to implement the plan. Well, why? Sure, he, I know they say he's dangerous and she can't come in, but I don't believe that. So I'm gonna let him come in. I know they're saying he's a problem, but I don't believe that. He's changed, he says he didn't do it. So I'm not gonna follow through with the visitation plan. Yeah, I'm gonna let him go out and spend time with him even though y'all said he shouldn't because I believe he won't do that. I know how I raised my child. See how hope can get in the way of the plan? I'm not gonna become an adoptive parent. I don't have to plan for a permanency plan. They're gonna get it together. He's going back home. So it's, that, it's because they may minimize the risk factors, that's why there might be problems implementing the plan. I used to write it up as resistant. We, I even, we give my, I'd, I'd even give them the diagnosis, oppositional defiant. No, it's hope. <laughs> it's hope. And it's that hope that makes them minimize the safety factor because they don't want to believe that it's necessary. They gotta help, they gotta come up with the concurrent plans. Even when they're hoping, that's the, that's the dichotomy. When you hope things are gonna work out, they still have to come up with the, 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 the plans and then they've got to figure out when it's time to implement them. And then they've got to help prepare the children for the disappointments. 
for the loss. Part of the problem with hope is not wanting to have, see hope makes you not have to deal with loss too. Hope makes you have to not to deal with disappointments. So if you're hoping, you don't have to deal with the child around loss or alternative plans because it's not gonna happen, they're going home. You want them to also not project their issues and project their hopes onto the child. And that last one is making sure that the child feels as though they're believed and protected. Hope can get in the way of protecting children because you minimize and relative caregivers minimize the risk. They want to believe it's not really going to happen. Hope will make them not believe who? The children. Because to believe the, to believe the birth parent may mean not believing who? Thank you. And the children need to be believed. So how do you do it? All right, first we've got to normalize the hope. The buy-in here and the motivation for relative caregivers is if you don't make plans, somebody else is going to plan for you. That's the buy-in. That's going to be the motivation. You should be hopeful, but don't let your hope prevent you from making alternative plans for the children before the courts do. And again, it's the motivation coming from if you don't plan, somebody's going to plan for you. Is there a backup plan to make sure the children remain with the, in the family and return home? And then I guess the one that I think is so important here, where you can actually join with the relative caregiver, you're not feeding into the fantasy, but you, can, but you can join and understand where they're coming from is this kind of statement. I hope that he gets through rehab, but if not, then what? I hope he gets the job. I hope you're right, but if not, then what? You've normalized it, but at the same time you're moving into, you gotta make some plans. Then you got to help them develop the plan. And you start with getting them to look at when will you know it's time to make an alternative plan. Again, it's empowering them and making them feel as though they have a right, a responsibility, and that they're entitled to be part of that plan. The buy-in is you and the child have a right to have a plan in case things fail. You and the child have a right to have a plan to avoid going into a crisis. That's the buy-in, okay? And then you can use these kinds of comments based on that buy-in. How much, what activities by the birth parent, your son or daughter, will let you know that it's time to create an alternative plan? This makes them hold the birth parent responsible. It puts on the birth parent. It doesn't put it all on them. You know, what do they have to do? Or the other way is, well, what activities or inactivities you see how that goes both ways? But it puts the responsibility on the birth parent and makes the relative caregiver hold the birth parent responsible. How much time, and if they don't get it, because they might say, well, we'll give them forever. You know, the unconditional loyalty, you know. Well, how much time and how many chances are the courts or agencies going to give him before they start making alternative plans? You know, we got that 12 months to work with. We got that 18 month timetable to work with. And that's where you can kind of like bring in the reality. And then not projecting their hopes on the child. Relative caregivers need this kind of a formula. How much disappointment can a child handle then determines how much hope you give them. I'll say it another way. If they can't handle the disappointment, then don't give them the what? Thank you. That's the formula you need to give relative caregivers to use when they start talking about making promises and projecting their hopes. And then you can talk about what hopes do you need to keep from the children and share only with adults. You know that boundary issue. You know, the children become their friend. But if the formula is, if they can't handle the disappointment, then don't give them the hope that helps them keep that straight. And then if you still have the hopes, then you need to take it somewhere else. How will you tell the children to recover from unfulfilled hopes? How will you recover, recover from unfulfilled hopes? Implementing safety plans. These first two are based on the relative caregiver's attachment to the birth parent. I know you don't believe he did it, but the agency does. What do you need to do to make sure your son or daughter is not in a position of being accused again? They want to protect that birth parent. That's the motivation. That's the buy-in. So what do you have to do to make sure he's not accused of abuse or neglect? And then the last two, 
is based, the buy-in there is protecting the child. How will you make the children feel that you believe what they're saying is true? And who will hurt the most if the children are removed because of, the, of, of, of you bending the rules? So when we start looking at differences between kinship care and relative caregivers, objectivity, concurrent and alternative planning, and the perception of the, of the birth parent, all three of those things are affected by attachment and bonding. I, I don't like to use this word, but sometimes it can get distorted. Sometimes it can get skewed. Sometimes it can be biased because of pre-existing relationships, bonding, attachment, loyalty. Foster parents, they don't have that to deal with. They don't have that pre-existing relationship. They don't have bonding and attachment with that, with that birth parent. Their bonding and attachment is with who first? Thank you. So that's where you begin to see the differences. For relative caregivers, the behavior of the birth parent they consider to be a reflection on them. So to give up hope is to give up on who? Thank you, themselves and the birth parent. To admit that the birth parent was a failure is to admit that who's a failure? They are, exactly. So that also reinforces a hope. And then you don't want that birth parent to feel as though you're giving up on them, even if you don't like them, you know. You still want them to know that I'm there for you. And then the last one for foster parents, there's not that attachment, so there's not that issue, okay? So here's your implications for practice. Allow relative caregivers their hope. That's the source of motivation. Remember that list you went through? Allow them the hope. Now, we, they, like I said, we may call it denial, <laughs> but if they're saying it's hope, fine. And use those scripts. I hope so, but if not, then what? All right, but allow the hope because that's the, that's the motivation. But at the same time, move them into alternative planning, permanency planning. Caregivers have to be able to manage their own hope first before they can help the child. They have to live with, be prepared for, plan for the disappointments in order for them to help the child deal with their disappointments. So safety planning, this may sound strange, but safety planning starts with the caregiver again. Dealing with hope, doing alternative planning, that's safety planning. And they've got to be okay and be able to plan in order for the child to be safe. Okay, well on that note, I'd like to thank Annie E. Casey for allowing me this opportunity to present. And I'd like to thank you for coming out to this training and fitting me into your busy schedule. And I hope you find this useful. Thank you so much for coming. Take care. Hello, welcome back. And I'm now going to summarize the training that you just, start, that you just saw. And I'm going to start with talking about what are the sources of hopes and fantasies for relative caregivers. Those sources, just the hope of children returning home, major source. Another source is believing that the birth parent is going to do it this time. So the belief and the hope that the birth parent will follow through. Another source is believing that they're going to get their life back. They're going to be able to be Re, you know, retired again, or just be a grandparent again, or just be an aunt again. Another source is wanting the children's hopes to be fulfilled and not them being disappointed again. Cues, he's gonna do it this time. I believe him, everything is gonna work out okay. Y'all need to stop trying to make him fail. Y'all need to believe in him because he's gonna do it this time. So your work, your goals, the most important goal is getting relative caregivers to implement those safety plans and to make those protection plans and permanency plans even if they don't believe it. For relative caregivers, the hope is, hope can sometimes cause relative caregivers to not perceive, the, to minimize the danger or to minimize the need for planning. So you've got to get them to still plan even though they're hoping. They've got to be able to not cause the children to have false hopes. The formula that they need, that we need to give them is, if the children can't handle the disappointment, then don't give them the hope. They have to all also be able to prioritize and be able to see you know, that the needs of the children come first. And that can also be a source of taking back hope. Implications for our practice, help relative caregivers identify the hope, make relative caregivers, if you can, look at what are the alternatives, to the hope and the discussion that you want to have is, I hope things work out, but if not, then what? That's your intervention 
That's the piece. That's safety planning with relative caregivers. I hope it works out, but if not, then what? Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming. Annie e. Casey, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to present. Thank you for fitting me in your schedule. I hope you find this training useful. Thank you.